Hi, everybody. This is Anne Marie Hunter. Um, I'm the director of Safe Haven's Interfaith Partnership Against Domestic Violence. I'm also an ordained United Methodist pastor. And um, I've been doing this work for some time. We're so, so happy that you're joining us. I want to welcome all of you here. This webinar is the first in a series of webinars that will explore domestic violence in the context of diverse faiths and ages and ethnicities. And today we're going to introduce the series by looking into the wider questions, which is, you know, why is faith important to victims and survivors to begin with, and why are faith community partnerships so important? So I'm so glad you're joining us, and thank you very much for being here. I wanted to uh, thank the Office on Violence Against Women, which is funding our project and this groundbreaking work. Um, we received funding in 2015 that allows us to expand our work beyond the rural communities we have been and are working with. And this webinar series is part of that expansion. Uh, in talking about the importance of faith, uh, I wanted to make sure right up front that we recognize that not all victims are faith affiliated. And we also recognize that many advocates are faith affiliated and many are not. Um, but we, we feel as though many people who work with victims and survivors, because faith is so important to them, um, are also themselves hoping to learn more about how to reach clients who are faith affiliated and how to partner with local uh, faith communities. So um, we hope you'll um, Type your questions in the chat box, and we'll get to those at the end. In the meantime, we hope you'll enjoy our presentation. Uh, as I said, my name is uh, Anne-Marie Hunter, and with me today are my colleagues, Allison Morse-Katzman, who is Safe Havens' as Associate Director, as well as Shireen akram Bushar, who is our Project Coordinator. And you'll be hearing from all of us throughout the presentation. Great. Um, we, uh, we'd like to know who's joining us today on this webinar, so uh, we invite you to take the poll that appears on your screen. And, and um, you can also type your name and agency into the chat box if you'd like. <laughs> How long should we wait? Got oh, okay. yeah. um, we would also like to learn a little bit about whether you've worked with faith-based victims and or, or organizations and the type of relationship you've established. Uh, please follow the poll prompts on your screen. It's great seeing that uh, many of you have worked with faith-based uh, victims before. Um, and with faith-based organizations, 73%. Great. All right. Okay, is there a way to close it? No. Okay, we've just lost our screen, <laughs> so I apologize. Um, here we go. Okay, perfect. All right. Uh -huh. Do you want to go to the next one? So we hope that today's webinar will strengthen your understanding of the role that faith can play in the lives of victims and how partnerships with faith leaders can lead to increased access to services. Just so you know a little bit about Safe Havens, we've been working at this intersection of domestic violence um, and faith for the past 25 years. Since the beginning, we've been a multi-religious agency, and we started our work in the greater Boston area really just raising awareness that domestic violence and faith do have something to do with each other, and that there should be a faith-based response um, for victims of domestic violence. We continued to raise awareness and developed a very intensive training program called the Family Violence Prevention Project. Uh, we trained a numerous uh, faith communities in the greater Boston area doing that. And as we were doing that, we caught the attention of the Office on Violence Against Women and in 2003, we became technical assistance providers 
uh, for grantees uh, through the OB, through OVW. Um, following that initial 2003 um, work, we continued to work with OVW uh, on the President's Family Justice Center initiative, and then continued our work uh, into rural communities, and um, and now in a more expanded way. We've always worked in a very grassroots manner, working with local um, and national community in that local and national communities with service providers, helping them reach out to their faith communities, meeting with the service providers in the communities, meeting with their faith communities, um, and really helping them catalyze relationships. Our sir, so in our work with OVW, we have developed a number of resources. Uh, our rural resources, some of you may have seen, I think I saw some rural um, grantees on the call, and you all know our resources very well. Um, just to share with you all a little bit, we have developed a number of rural resources that include a toolkit that has resources for not only advocates but also for faith leaders so that they can go to their faith leaders with these resources about domestic violence and sexual violence and share them with the, um, with the faith leaders. We have taken into account that faith leaders are only going to read a little bit at a time and we have a number of different options, a very short booklet, an even shorter brochure, and a, a bookmark. Uh, these are all available online. We also developed a partnership guide uh, for working faith leaders and service providers working together. We have a training curriculum that we've been presenting over the past two and a half years in rural communities. And we have an outreach guide that can help um, advocates reach out to their faith leaders and, and troubleshoot on some of the challenges that they may be finding. And all of these resources are available on our website. We also, um, beginning in 2008, began working with the National Co Clearinghouse on Abuse in Later Life. Given the importance of faith in the lives of older adults, this was a logical collaboration. Older adults are 89% faith affiliated and 50% of older adults are involved in a faith community on a weekly basis. When asked where they might turn for help, older adults indicated that they would turn first to their trusted faith leaders. So, Clearly, this collaboration was a no-brainer. As a result of the collaboration, we developed a, a toolkit that is, again, for advocates and for faith leaders that includes resources that advocates can bring to their faith leaders to talk about elder abuse and faith. We have an outreach guide and a partnership guide as well, and we are working on a, a training curriculum that we think will be out hopefully this fall or um, a little bit towards the end of the year. So we're going to dive right into why faith is important. Um, as many of you know, uh, well, we just talked about the importance of faith for older adults, but across the U.S., a substantial majority of people report a faith affiliation. There are many communities in the U.S. in which a faith-based institution is the only resource available or is the only trusted resource or is simply a vibrant part of the community and central to its members. It is not news to advocates that victims encounter many barriers to safety depending on their age, culture, economic status, race, family, and faith. Victims turn first uh, for help to family, friends, and often people they know throughout the faith community. The Georgia Domestic Violence Fatality Review uh, learned quickly that many victims were faith involved. Some had asked for help and some hadn't, but the faith community offered a significant opportunity to reach victims with information about local services. Research shows that older adults would most likely reach out to a faith leader. Faith may be central to understanding of marriage, intimate relationships, family, and gender roles. Even for people who are not observant, many will fall back on their family's faith and cultural traditions when they envision family, marriage, and partnerships. So partnerships with faith communities can provide an enormous opportunity in your, in your community. So you may have heard uh, realtors say location, location, location. 
Um, I would argue that trusted faith members and leaders are perfectly located to be a listening ear, to see and hear what's going on in, their, in the lives of their congregants or their fellow congregants, um, to recognize the red flags, and to be a bridge to community resources and services. There's lots of ways that faith leaders and faith community members can be helpful. Um, so faith communities represent an invaluable opportunity to reach faith-affiliated victims with information about domestic violence and available services and with life-saving support and safety. So our goal going forward is to make sure that faith communities and faith leaders are as big a resource and as little a roadblock as possible for victims who are faith-affiliated. Working with faith leaders is one way to sort of surround victims with a circle of people who care and know how to help. And in addition, faith communities can also be a great way to get your resources out into the community. Oftentimes, faith communities allow various groups to use their buildings, and it might be a preschool or a AA group or the Scouts or uh, 4-H or anything like that. Um, people are in and out of these buildings often um, during the week and on the weekends. So having your resources available in that building, like palm cards and brochures, flyers, et cetera, allow even more people to learn about your services. And they're getting these, this, you know, sort of like a referral from a place that they really know and trust. And that can be very helpful as well. In addition, if you put resources out in, an, in a faith community, the message is we recognize that this is happening in our community and it's important to respond to. Years ago, I worked in a domestic violence agency in the Boston area, and I was just astonished at the number of clients who talked about their faith. One woman said she turned the other cheek until she ran out of faces. It just broke my heart, and Safe Havens was founded by me and some other women of faith um, to really focus on the intersection between faith and abuse and to look at the many people who felt forced to choose between faith and safety. Because when given that choice, many victims who are faithful will choose faith rather than safety, and that can have disastrous consequences, as you all know. Whether victims feel like they're being punished or tested, that they're being taught something or that they're meant to suffer, victims may understand their experiences through, their le through a lens of their faith. One, um, many years, probably eight or ten years ago, Safe Havens received a phone call from a, um, an organization in, that was serving um, an immigrant and refugee population in the greater Boston area, and they were perplexed because they were having victims, they were seeing victims and they were coming up with these wonderful safety plans, and, and the victims would go all home and, and they would come back weeks later and they weren't following their safety plans. And, and of course, the agency um, advocates understood that's their choice, but they were trying to get it. Why weren't they following through on their safety plans and come to find out the faith leaders in their community were telling the victims that they needed to not follow the safety plan, that they needed to make the marriage work. And that's when this agency called us and we began to work together um, to look at how faith and how domestic violence, how we could work together, how we could educate their faith leaders so that victims could feel that they could look, that they could be faithful and safe at the same time. Victims are suffering spiritually as well as physically, financially, and emotionally. Earlier we talked about how many Americans are faith affiliated. And for these Americans, faith can be a source of strength, courage, and connection. However, turning to a faith leader may not always be helpful to a victim. Tenants of many faiths have been misinterpreted to support abuse. 
Victim, victims sometimes sacrifice their own safety to protect the abuser, to keep the family together, to safeguard the honor of the family, to uphold religious values such as forgiveness. Also, faith leaders have not received training and resources about abuse. As a result, faith leaders can be manipulated by abusers. Faith leaders sometimes misunderstand the seriousness of the abuse. All of this means that for survivors who are faith affiliated, faith can be a barrier to safety and it can be a resource. We're going to talk about faith as a barrier to safety first for just a moment. So you all know that abuse is often silenced and denied within faith communities. There was a nationwide study done um, and published in 2002 of uh, African-American congregations in 12 cities across the U.S. And they uh, asked folks, what is the number one barrier to seeking safety or help, seeking help? And they heard that it was denial in the, in the faith community that was really keeping people back. Um, this study focused on the African-American community, but denial and silencing occur in all communities across the United States. The language that describes an incident of sexual or domestic violence is ugly and often profane. Um, so in addition to the denial and silencing and blaming and so forth, um, victims of uh, uh, safe havens has coined the term sanitizing to talk about the way that victims, when they talk to their faith leaders about abuse, uh, really sanitize the language. So um, as advocates, you're used to victims minimizing um, and faith leaders, and victims minimize when they talk to faith leaders as well, of course. Um, faith leaders aren't trained to know that minimizing is going on, but in addition, when victims talk to faith leaders, we truly believe that they sanitize. So um, faith leaders are not hearing the graphic language or the very detailed explanation of what has just happened. And as a result, um, it's possible for the faith leader and the service provider or the advocate to be hearing things in a very different way and as a result to be on different pages or kind of at odds with each other in the way that they respond. I think that when faith leaders are lacking training and resources, there are, there are lots of ways that we can respond that can be very dangerous. Um, and one of the most painful for victims is when a trusted faith leader is manipulated by the abuser and basically used as a weapon against the victim. Um, our colleague Julie Olins has commented, abusers know how to manipulate pastors. Abusers will ask for forgiveness and say they want to reconcile with their spouses. And that's what pastors want to hear. It can be a lot easier to believe the abuser than to help a victim. So when faith leaders don't know how to listen, they don't realize that victims minimize, they don't realize they're hearing a sanitized version of what happened, they may not appreciate the depth of what's happening, the dangerousness of it, and they may endanger victims and prolong the agony. When faith leaders and faith communities do get training and resources about abuse, faith can be more effective as a resource for victims who are faith affiliated. In addition, faith communities and faith leaders can be allies in efforts to address domestic violence. The word religion comes from Latin religare, which means to connect or to bind. Religare also has the same root as the word ligament, a connective tissue in our bodies. Abuse isolates people, destroys relationships, and breaks the covenant of marriage and the bonds of family and community. For survivors who are faith affiliated, religion, spirituality, or faith can provide a connection to community, family, history, language, and spiritual roots. Abuse takes so many things away. For victims who are faith affiliated, religion can be a resource that no one can take away. And faith can help a survivor grieve. Abuse is also very disorienting. Abusers deliberately confuse and confound their victims. Faith is one of the ways victims may orient, orient themselves in time and space. Whether it is praying five times a day facing Mecca, 
Worshiping in a sanctuary facing east or marking time in a series of holidays and high holidays. Faith can keep victims grounded and centered. We um, heard a story through our work on elder abuse that I wanted to share with y'all. Um, uh, this was an older woman. She had experienced years and years of abuse. Uh, physical, sexual, emotional, spiritual, etc. And um, when her partner retired, it got worse because he was around the house more frequently. She didn't want to get a divorce because she was Roman Catholic and that was not something that she would choose, but she did want to, to live separately from him because she felt she needed to do that for her own safety. So she went to her priest, made an appointment, told him what was happening and asked for his advice. And he said, this is not part of a Christian marriage. Abuse is not part of a Christian marriage. And if you need to leave, live separately in order to be safe, that's what you should do. So she was surprised, very surprised, because that's not the advice that she had heard from her uh, faith community in the past. But she went and found an apartment. But before she signed on the dotted line for the lease, she had a moment of, um, of concern, and she thought, what if that was just a rogue priest? <laughs> and so she made an appointment with the priest in the parish where her new apartment would be. She made the appointment. She went in. She told him what was happening, and she got exactly the same response. And so she went ahead uh, to sign the lease, but just before she could sign, she decided she better... Um, she better talk to her childhood priest. And I'd like to point out here that I think I could be dying of cancer and probably not get more than two opinions, but this was so important to her that she got a third opinion. She went to the childhood priest, made the appointment, told him what was happening, and she got exactly the same result. So when she was talking to us about this, she said that... Um, this was so important to her that these were the best times of her life, the best years of her life. She said she didn't have a whole lot of money, but that uh, she had her apartment, she was safe, she had her cat and her grandchildren, and this was just the happiest years. And we asked her what would have happened if any of those three priests had said, uh, you know, no, you have to stay. And she said, of course, she would have stayed with the relationship, no matter what it, that meant for her own safety. So I'm telling you all that just to say that, that faith leaders and people in faith communities have a tremendous amount of power and can use that power to um, help people find safety. And again, I want to um, just mention that, of course, we know that all survivors don't identify with a particular faith or a particular tradition. Um, but I do, I would argue that all survivors need to be heard and affirmed and have someone bear witness to the story. Um, you all are familiar with the work of Judith Herman, uh, who wrote uh, Trauma and Recovery, one of the very first trauma um, studiers and researchers. And she did an article not long ago um, called Justice from the Victim's Perspective. And she actually talked to victims of abuse of all kinds and asked, uh, what is it that would help you heal and move forward? And they mentioned the importance of someone hearing the story in their own words without interruption and acknowledging that this is abuse and acknowledging that it wasn't their fault and um, lift, lifting that burden of, of shame and uh, blame from their shoulders and putting it on the shoulders where it belongs, which be, would be the shoulders of the of the victim. So from that perspective, I think um, spiritual leaders, people in faith communities can all play a role in helping people reach safety and justice and healing. So safe havens would suggest that faith leaders and faith communities can work to address domestic violence by intervention, hopefully on the earlier side, um, by prevention and through long-term social change. In regards to earlier intervention um, or intervention, one of the most important things a faith leader can do is break the silence about domestic violence in his or her congregation. Victims still are thinking that they're the only ones in their community, in their faith community, who are experiencing abuse. 
Even as recently as yesterday, we heard from a victim during our training in North Carolina about how she never thought to turn to anyone in her faith community because no one had ever mentioned domestic violence. There were no posters. There was nothing in her congregation that ever suggested that anyone would acknowledge that there's such a thing as domestic violence. In regards to prevention, working together, faith leaders and advocates can come up with creative programming to address domestic violence in their communities. Um, and as far as long-term social change, faith leaders can set the moral tone for their communities. They can help challenge all the isms that help support domestic violence. Um, so we're hoping that you advocates, and if there are any faith leaders on the call I couldn't quite see, but that you all will work together. Um, we want, we're really trying to build a two-way street, and we don't expect that the um, faith leaders are going to become experts in domestic violence, and we don't really want them to be, and we don't feel that the advocates can um, need to be experts in faith. But working together, you're going to be able to help victims. I want to share um, a story about this, this kind of thing. Um, we were on one of our rural trainings, um, at one of our catalyst trainings, uh, one of the clergy that was attending, um, this pat we'll call him Pastor Bob, he was on the verge of tears. He confessed to us that he had tried to help a domestic violence victim and her children two years earlier. He did all that he could. He helped her get an apartment. He helped her get a job. He thought everything was all set. He brought in people and helped her move. Um, but it turns out that her needs were beyond his resources and skills. The job fell through. The apartment was too expensive. She couldn't afford daycare. She didn't have reliable transportation. And after months of struggle, the victim returned to the abuser. Pastor Bob said if he had only known about the services um, of the, the service provider in his community, things for that victim would have turned out so very differently. Victims can talk to advocates about the abuse, but they may not be able to talk about their faith. And victims can talk to their faith leaders about their faith, but maybe not about the abuse. So when advocates and victims are not working together, it's really the victims who are suffering and who are falling through the cracks. And this is why OBW has funded Safe Haven's work. Over the past three years, Safe Havens has provided training and technical assistance across the country, including in Arizona, North Dakota, Alaska, Colorado, Louisiana, Idaho, Maine, North Carolina, West Virginia, Texas, and Vermont. We have four more training slots available, including one that is specifically for a rural community. And we really do hope that we'll be able to continue this work. The importance of building community partnerships is at the heart of our trainings. Uh, for more information, please take a look at our Hearts and Hands Partnership Guide and our Religious Community Response Wheel. We encourage our training communities to identify creative ways to strengthen the safety net around victims. Uh, here are some ideas for building long-term relationships. When working with faith leaders, we suggest advocates share about the work that their agency does. And in doing this, we hope that you will make absolutely no assumptions that faith leaders have uh, sort of a baseline of, of uh, understanding. Um, please be as, as accessible as you can in the, in the language you use. For example, um, a, an advocate could talk to me as a faith leader about 209As, and I would not know what that was. Um, you'd really have to start at the ground floor and explain to me what a restraining order is, and then explain that 209A is the statutory number of the restraining order, I mean, it's, it's at that level. We really, most faith leaders really need that very basic understanding. 
Um, there's a lot of jargon in both faith communities and in uh, an advocate's work. Um, and we hope that uh, we can build a common language that gets beyond that and invites everyone to the table and um, provides a, a resource that's as accessible as possible to the community. In any faith community, um, or in any community, we need faith leaders to speak out and to educate their communities and to break the silence. As you heard earlier, that's so, so important um, to be able to talk about this within our faith community. Uh, at a, a focus group of clergy in 2009, uh, this was the response of one of the clergy participants that uh, he clearly saw the need for a wider strategic plan and not just, not just something in one congregation, but sort of a wider effort. Um, and not just one event, but a wider um, approach. So we're hoping that you will look to build long-term relationships with faith communities that go beyond just a one-time event or training and really look at partnership over, the, the, over time. So as you're thinking, uh, you're, we're coming towards the end of the um, webinar, and we hope that you don't just say, okay, I did this webinar and, and that's enough, I know enough. Um, we're really hoping that you'll take a few minutes after the webinar is over to think of a, of a few concrete actions and maybe spend a little bit of time jotting down some notes so that at least you've gotten started and, and maybe you can and actually make that happen over the next month or two. So I mentioned earlier that we um, have been doing this work for 25 years. And we've come up with some wisdom for the journey, some things that we've learned over the years um, not that are not specifically how to work, but, but just sort of bigger picture um, to keep things to keep in mind as you do this work. We really hope that you will consider reaching out to us to look at our resources, to consider working with us. Don't hesitate to call us with questions, comments, concerns. Let us know how we can help you work with your faith communities. So in that year, 2009, we hosted a, a, a several different focus groups, and one of them was for survivors. And out of this, we learned that victims really want their faith leaders brought into this conversation. And so we hope you'll take the time to reach out in your communities to build these critical relationships with your faith leaders and your congregations. And if we can help you do that, don't hesitate to call. So today was just the first of our webinar series. And this is the schedule for the upcoming webinars that will look um, in more detail at particular um, faith and cultural perspectives on abuse, and, um, and also age perspectives on abuse. Um, we hope that you will sign up for as many of these as you can, and we cannot thank you enough uh, for um, being part of this. We really hope to build a national movement of advocates and faith leaders who are working together to uh, respond to victims in a way that's very holistic. Um, we, I know that you all are busy building coordinated community responses in your in your communities, and uh, we love that. The idea of that is to surround a victim with um, a consistent message and with help from many doors. So there are many open doors to help. Um, so we're hoping that a victim would hear the same consistent message from their daycare provider or from their doctor or from an advocate or uh, from a neighbor or friend. Um, Sometimes in the past, the faith community's message has been at odds with that. They might hear from an advocate, I'm really concerned about your safety, and they might hear from a faith leader, make this relationship work no matter what. So it's important to um, think not only about coordinated community responses, but we have coined the phrase coherent coordinated community responses to say how important it is for us to bring the faith community alongside in a way that our, uh, and I'm speaking now as a faith leader, that our messages can be coherent with the messages of advocates that um, we are concerned about the safety of every single victim and of their families and children. 
we do believe that safety is of paramount importance to everyone and that everyone has the right to be safe in their families and homes. So this is part of a wider effort. We're so, so glad you've joined us today. We hope you'll join us in the rest of the webinars. And also, please, as Allison said, feel free to call us with questions or concerns, or even if you'd like to have us come and do a training in your community. So we're going to open it up now for questions. And I know Alicia was monitoring and would be happy to tell us what those questions are. And if you have questions at this point, I can't, there are so many, so many things we can't cram into a webinar. So please feel free to type your questions into the chat box and we'd be happy to respond to them. Hi, this is Alicia over here. Um, I didn't see many questions in the chat box for you, um, but I know that some people sent some in advance. So we're just going to start off with those, and then as people have other questions, they can type them in the chat box. Perfect. All right. So one of the first ones we had was, what are some ideas for events and community actions that you can recommend to bring to local congregations? Oh, that's a really great question. Um, I'm thinking of, well, there are many, many things. There are fairly simple things. Uh, there are congregations that we've heard about across the U.S. that are uh, really in-gathering places for things that the service provider may need, uh, toiletries or furniture for a new apartment or sometimes duffel bags for folks who come. I know um, I used to work in a shelter. Many people came in with their belongings in a black garbage bag, which was very sad for me. Uh, so um, looking, looking to gather up um, uh, duffel bags or luggage that's not being used, um, things like that. Faith communities can be a good uh, source for that. Um, and also for funding and support in that way. So there's that. Um, we'd also love to see faith leaders become more involved. Um, one of the things we've done here is ask faith communities to gather used cell phones for us. We are um, recycling those, and some of you may be as well. The newer phones are used to, um, to uh, provide to victims and able to call 911. And the um, uh, older phones are recycled just for money, and that money comes back to support our uh, resources and our trainings uh, in the local community. Um, we also encourage faith communities to think about, uh, and this is kind of a bigger idea for faith community, but um, we've seen models where faith communities are putting together vigils against domestic violence sometimes to occur during October. Um, and this could be a service that invites the entire community. I know from my own congregation, uh, I pastored for six years here near Boston. And in my faith community, I had um, school, school personnel, I had the uh, law enforcement, I had some police officers in my congregation, I had several business members, et cetera. So just reaching out through my faith community, my own congregation, I could include a lot of the institutions in the community, and we invited all of them and gave them a role so they would come. Um, and we also reached out to all the other faith communities and asked them if they would also partner with us on this event. And it became an annual event and actually ended up moving from faith community to faith community within, the, uh, within our little town. And so it became a very interfaith event because we invited everyone and uh, the way that it moved from congregation to congregation. There was another vigil effort not far from Boston that began at a synagogue with the blowing of the shofar and the words of a, of a rabbi. And then with signs, we marched through the center of town to sort of make our statement and ended up at a, a Christian community where we, um, where we finished up with uh, speakers and uh, the rest of the, of the liturgy. So those are some ideas as well for how to raise awareness in the, in the community and how to do it as, as an interfaith effort or as a community-wide effort. Um, it can also be as simple as a social media campaign. Mm -hmm. um, one 
thing that is great about social media is that everyone's starting to get involved from younger people to older people. Um, and the more people that you have on, whether it's Facebook or Twitter, you know, maybe you want to do a tweet chat or maybe you want to do something um, where every day during the month of October you're posting something uh, specific to Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Those are um, more in-house. They're reaching out to the community, but they're not as, uh, depending on how much staff you have, they're not as um, labor intensive. It might be a good way to catalyze some relationships and, and some conversations that way. Mm -hmm. We've also had some luck um, taking a whiteboard around. So for example, if you were um, visiting a faith community, maybe to do some training, um, take a whiteboard with you and just write at the top, I care about domestic violence because dot, 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 and ask folks to fill that in and um, to, and then take a picture with your cell phone of the, of the person standing there with their statement. And those are great to post on Facebook and uh, websites. Or to compile into a, a, a flyer or a newsletter. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then I had another idea as well. Oh, we really encourage... Um, faith communities to reach out to y'all and to ask for training, um, either for maybe preventive training about dating violence or about healthy relationships for the young people that are in the congregation. Um, you could also be invited to come and speak to the wider community about domestic violence and the importance of um, reaching out and providing education. Um, you'll also see in our toolkits that we have posters uh, for um, domestic violence, for sexual violence, and also for elder abuse. We encourage faith leaders to post these. There's a place on the poster for them to um, print out a sticker with your uh, agency contact information and stick that on the poster and then put it up in the bathroom. Uh, so that's another way. We really encourage them, I, I, I must say, uh, we encourage them to have a relationship with you and to know about your services and how to refer before they start doing things like putting up re um, posters because we want uh, faith leaders to not only say we could talk about this but also know how to talk about it and how to refer to your services. So it all kind of comes together as a piece. So from from ti taking tiny steps to taking on maybe preaching about this from the pulpit or um, publishing a newsletter article perhaps about your services and your hotline numbers. Or um, we've also encouraged faith communities to open up the footer on their monthly newsletter or biweekly newsletter and also on their, on their um, weekly um, program, service program and to um, uh, put the hotline number in that footer and then just close it and let it be there for a while. Um, and we encourage faith leaders to, or in faith communities to do this and to keep it there for a while. And we explain to them that a victim doesn't necessarily want to be walking around with the newsletter that has the hotline number, but if every newsletter and every service bulletin has the hotline number, then it's possible for a victim to maybe carry that around and it doesn't look quite so suspicious and yet there's the number, there's the resource um, for when a victim might need it. Are there other ideas? Allison, do you have any other ideas, Shereen? Okay, next question. All right, we had another question come in. What are, the, what are some of the best approaches to getting faith leaders interested in being educated about domestic abuse? And are there materials out there? Um, yeah, we do have our outreach guides, so take a look at those. Um, we've come up with some of the barriers. We made a list of some of the barriers that we've encountered in doing outreach, and then we um, have strategies that we've used in the past to get around those barriers, so that might be helpful. Um, we also did a, um, a focus group with clergy. These were particularly rural clergy and learned a lot about how, what had invited them into the conversation. And we heard, um, I'll never forget one rural clergy person who said to me that he had gone to a hospital-based training about domestic violence. And uh, I asked him, well, what got you in the room? Because I know faith leaders are so, so busy. Um, but he said that the flyer about this hospital-based training said, 
the work that you do is aimed towards clergy, and it said the, faith, the work that you are doing is as important to the safety and health of our communities as our work is. So I think inviting faith leaders in as colleagues, as valued um, peers, as people that you appreciate have a body of knowledge and expertise and skills that can be very helpful, um, to really say to them, we're doing great work on this and we need your help and explain that uh, they are really pivotal to uh, the work in your community. Maybe use an example where you have had a victim who really um, struggled with her faith and uh, how important that is to so many victims and explain that and say, I really, really would love to have your, faith, your, your partnership and your help on this community-wide project. Um, and it's also important for faith leaders to know that Although they may not be seeing abuse, that statistically it's pretty impossible that anyone has a faith community that does not include um, victims and survivors, and that that might look like a lot of things. It might be people turning to them for healing. It might be people looking for a safe place for their children to go learn about spiritual practices. It might be um, folks who have themselves been uh, victims who would like to um, have a better way of approaching that so and sort of processing it. So it's um, helpful also to reach out to them and let them know how very, very important their work is to this effort. I hope that helps to answer the question. Do you all have other ideas for approaching faith leaders? I, okay. So any other questions? Yes, um, we have a couple people wondering where we can find those materials you mentioned and where can they locate the toolkit. Oh, okay, the toolkits are on our website and they're downloadable for free in both black and white and color versions. Um, the downloaded version is not as beautiful as the printed ones that we have here at the office. So if you email us or call us, and our email is info at interface. F-A-I-T-H, partners, with an S at the end, dot O-R-G. And our phone number is 617-951-3980. I'm going to put our, our contact information is right here. Um, if you call us or email us, we're more than happy to send out um, the toolkits or the partnership guides or outreach guides, anything that would be helpful. If you um, go to, on our website, go to the resources, button, and then with the drop-down menu, it will have um, different kinds of resources there. That you can download for free. The only one that doesn't download well is the bookmark, which is associated with our elder abuse resources. So, um, and they're pretty easy to print, pretty cheap to print. So if you'd like a bunch of those, that um, our idea with the bookmark was that in faith communities, people often carry a book of scripture, a book of prayer, or a book of um, you know, something to do with their faith community. So we were thinking that these bookmarks could go into those um, and become sort of a long-term resource. They include uh, referral numbers for more information and also where to call in a crisis. And um, just have a tiny bit of information about elder abuse. Um, so we're happy to send those out as well. And um, you can give those out in bulk in faith communities and just ask people to put them in their books and um, carry them around as a resource. Um, you know, another thing that we haven't mentioned that I feel like I should, and this might be in terms also going back to the question of how to persuade faith communities and faith leaders that they're important to this effort. Um, we really believe, given the research that shows that people reach out to their faith communities for help, um, we really believe that anyone in a faith community could be a first responder. So that might be my faith leader, but it might also be um, someone uh, in the choir or someone who sits next to me in a scripture study or, or the administrative assistant on Tuesday morning. So we really encourage faith community people to feel that, to, to acknowledge that they could be a first responder. And as a result, it's really, really important for them to get training. We wouldn't send a firefighter into a burning building without help and uh, or without training. And um, 
similarly, it's, it's not fair to faith leaders or faith communities to expect them to be first responders without any kind of training and partnerships with, with all of you advocates. So we really encourage them to think of themselves as first responders, but also to know where to refer folks in the community. Our mantra with faith leaders is always refer, refer, refer. And we really encourage them to build the relationship with you as advocates and to reach out. Um, we talk to them a lot about supported referrals and what that might look like. Um, you know, it's one per thing to say to someone, you know, call 911 or call the police and in, in a crisis. But if a trusted faith leader says to someone, um, I just met the advocate at our local service provider. Here's what he or she can do. Here's the services they provide. You know, that might be a nice option. I would be happy to sit with you while you call, or you could offer to meet with them here at the faith community, or anything like that um, to help folks connect to services uh, is just crucially important in the lives of victims. So many victims, as you know, don't reach services, and that's the most dangerous thing, I think, um, is to try to face this by themselves. So I just want to add one other thing about working with your faith communities. Um, once you find a faith leader that you that understands your services and understands the issue and really seems to support the work that you're doing, leverage that. Um, maybe that clergy person can help you, you know, co-sign a letter as you're reaching out to other uh, faith leaders. Maybe that clergy person would be willing to make a few phone calls on your agency's behalf. Um, clergy like to hear from other clergy, and so being able to partner with a few clergy members is going to um, help um, kind of um, ease the way as you continue to work in your faith community. And many communities also have a clergy group or consortium that meets sometimes weekly, sometimes monthly. It's typically interfaith or ecumenical, uh, and it's really clergy supporting clergy. Uh, if you can ask a clergy person who is supportive of your work to get you on the agenda and to introduce you, most importantly, to introduce you to the other faith leaders and to say a word about how important your work is to the community, um, that can go a long way as well in terms of opening doors in other faith communities. So that's another way to leverage a faith community leader who you feel is already an ally. Any other questions, comments? Well, with, with that, I think we will wrap it up here. And I can't thank you enough for uh, being part of this today. I'm so, so thrilled uh, to see that uh, folks from around the country are here. And um, I hope you'll visit our website, take a look at the toolkit. And again, if you call us, we're happy to send you printed copies of the toolkit. Um, and there's one other thing I should tell you. We have a rural and an elder abuse toolkit. We're currently working with our 2015 grant to um, take our toolkits and make them uh, more uh, appropriate for a wider audience and not just rural. So, those should be out fairly soon. In the, in the meantime, I think um, the toolkits that we have, you might be able to use as a stopgap measure. But we are uh, widening those resources to include many of you who are in suburban or urban settings. Um, so those should be available, I hope, soon as well. So we are working on it. We're getting there as quickly as we can. Uh, so visit the website. Call us if you like. Email. And we're happy to be. Um, a resource to you as you do this very important work. And we are so, so grateful for what you're doing. It means so much to victims. Um, we asked victims once, what would you want to say to faith leaders? And they all said, training is the most important thing. And we know that you all are the key to that training. So thank you, thank you for um, really bringing to life uh, what victims are so much hoping will happen in their communities. So. Um, with that, we'll say goodbye, and we'll see you at the next webinar, I hope. And thank you so much. <laughs>